captions. I am slacking today. All right, <laughs> there we go. All right, so I have included this video up here because I think it's just it's easy to kind of visualize in a video how this happens. So we see that the monomers, they have the hydrogen side, they have that hydroxide side, right? They'll come together. The 1H on one side and the OH on the other side will leave the molecule to create water. And what's left behind are these monomers bound together. All right? So we're taking away water, we're dehydrating the molecule, you can think of it. Now this reaction is catalyzed by enzymes. I threw this out here because we will talk about enzymes eventually, not quite yet though, um, but enzymes can speed up this reaction. All right, if we want to take apart the reaction, it's exactly the opposite. We call this a hydrolysis reaction, and it's exactly the reverse. This time, instead of taking water away, you're inputting water back into this reaction here. You can see we're adding water back into the reaction. It's going to add back in that uh, hydrogen and that hydroxide group on either side of our monomers. And we'll split that monomer off right, until eventually we have our single monomers again. And again, I do have this YouTube video just to kind of help visualize this happening here. We have water entering into the um, polymer here. and adding the hydrogen to one side, the hydroxide group to the other side, and splitting those monomers apart. Any questions? Right, I'm trying out this poll again. If you all like using this poll, let me know. I think it's kind of fun just to kind of get some immediate input as to uh, are we understanding what we are learning about. So go ahead and do this poll. I'll give you a few seconds before I pull up the results. Right. Yes, majority has it. It is a dehydration reaction. We are removing water away from our um, polymer. All right. Any questions? All right. We're going to continue on. All right. So between today and Friday, we're going to talk about four major types of organic molecules. Right. Today, we're going to focus on the carbohydrates and the lipids. Right. I know there's a lot of text on here. Right. I am going to move forward because I'm going to explain these in a little bit more detail here. So we're going to start with carbohydrates. Right. Carbohydrates are the biological molecules that contain carbon, they contain hydrogen, and they contain Right. Now, they do form these polymers, and they do have a monomer. Right. The monomer for carbohydrates are going to be generally called monosaccharides. Right. Now, it can be more specific and say, in this specific carbohydrate, right, the monosaccharide might be a specific type of sugar. So we have these sugar monomers called monosaccharides. Those monosaccharides could be galactose and fructose and fructose. Sometimes you might see them drawn linearly. I can't say that word today. Uh, in a line, right? But most commonly you'll see them in these rings, right? Um, when I say it's in a five to six carbon ring, if we're literally just counting up the number of carbons in our molecules, so you can see they are numbered on this image. Right. So when we start to combine these monosaccharides together is when we start to build our uh, polymers, which we would call polysaccharides. Right. 
So our polysaccharides, they will be built off of all of these sugar monomers here. Right. Monosaccharides, they're great, right? They're important because they fuel a lot of cellular work. Right. Um, they're used in a whole bunch of processes within our body here, and they can be used to manufacture other molecules as well. But in our bodies, they're not often going to be floating around as these single molecules. They're often going to be stored as a polymer as a larger molecule. And then as our body needs them, we will break them down into individual monomers. Okay. So in order to get it to form these large polymers here, we are going to go through a dehydration reaction. Right. Same concept we just saw in our generalized example here. Right. In this example, we have glucose and fructose. Right. We are using the hydrogen from one side of glucose, or glucose here and the hydroxide group on the other side of fructose. We're taking away that water molecule. They are now bonded together. Okay. Now you might notice it says it's a glycosidic bond here. Okay. That's a name for the type of bond between our two sugar molecules. It's a covalent bond. Right? It's just a more specific name for this type of bond. Right? Now we can form these disaccharides here. But in our bodies, we're often going to see them as these large polysaccharides. And I mean large, I mean they are huge macromolecules. We can kind of see this in this image here that there is just thousands upon thousands of those monomers of sugars bound together. Now, each of these do some important functions, right? So, for example, a polysaccharide could be a starch, um, a, glycogen, a glycogen, and a cellulose. I'm going to have us all discover what they do on our own. So I'm going to have us take a couple minutes to use the internet, Google why are these polysaccharides biologically important, and then I will come back and uh, we'll, we'll discuss and I'll give you the answers. Um, I'm only going to allot like two minutes for this. So if I could have the groups on this side of the room start with the top two, it starts
All right, so that is two minutes here. Can I get a group to volunteer the answer as to why starch is important? Yeah. Because it's Yeah. Yeah. Stores energy in plants. Now, it's a macromolecule made up of uh, sugar monomers, stores energy. Um, so, like, it's super also fetal, starch filled. Like, that's the energy stores unit for the plant. What about the glycogen? Can I have the extra to provide you the answer for that one? Yes. Yeah, it can help regulate blood sugar levels. Um, I put it stores energy in animals because it can be a, a short term energy storage. But if we're talking physiologically, it can be broken down to help regulate uh, blood sugar levels. What about cellulose? Yeah, it provides structure to the cell walls of plant cells, and we'll go over what a, a cell wall is right now. But right now, you're talking about five structures to the cell. And then what about chitin? Yeah. Exactly. Right. It provides structure to exoskeletons for a lot of insects and crustaceans. I put this image up here, which it's a little, the lights are a little bright on it right here. But you can see the grasshopper's like shedding its skin. That skin is the exoskeleton made up of chitin. But we can also find it in cell walls of fungal cells. All right, so carbohydrates, super important. Any questions that came up? All right, we're going to move on to lipids. Now, lipids can be an oddball here because they don't look similar to some of our other biological molecules. Um, so lipids, so like think fats, think oils, um, think steroids, uh, they are carbon and hydrogen uh, linked together by these nonpolar covalent bonds. Sometimes they might have oxygen on its end. You can see that down here in these fatty acids. We have mostly carbon, carbon and hydrogen linked together, but on the ends we do have a couple molecules of oxygen. Right, so they do have some polar regions to them. But because most of it is not polar, they tend to be very insoluble in water. So think of oil trying to mix with water. Hard to do. Now, lipids are, like I said, different, right? They do not have monocles. Yes. I'm going to have you hold on to that thought because we're going to explore that in this question at the end. Yes. So, great question because it's a question I am posing to you. All right. So, lipids, they don't have monomers. All right. They don't form polymers. And they tend to be smaller molecules than those huge starch molecules or those huge cellulose molecules. There are three types of lipids, and we'll go over each of these three types here. Um, but fats, phospholipids, and steroids are the three types. And they each function a little bit differently in the body. Right? And like I said, they're not built from monomers. So we're going to start by looking at our fats. Fats can often be called triglycerides, right? and the reason they are called triglycerides is because they have three tri, fatty acids joined to a glycerol uh, molecule. So here we have our glycerol molecule in the end here, and we have our three fatty acids. Just like we've seen previously, they are joined together via dehydration reaction. So we're taking water away, and that allows these bonds to form. Okay. And if we look at the final molecule here, if I had to try to explain this, I would say it kind of looks like a comb with only three bristles on it. Right. 
right? Maybe it doesn't look like that at all to you, but that's how it looks like to me. So we have our comb and our three bristles branching off, all right? Now, fats are really, really great at storing energy. Okay. One of their primary functions. But we can have different types of fats, right? So if you go grocery shopping, you might have seen like the word saturated fatty acids or unsaturated. Right? And that has to deal with a number of hydrogens that we can find in these fats. So if it's a saturated fatty acid, it means it has the most hydrogen possible that could be bonded to this fatty acid. Right? So butter is a great example of a saturated fatty acid. Right, those hydrogen molecules, they're tightly packed together. Uh, a lot of animal fats can be uh, these saturated fatty acids, and they tend to be solid at room temperature, like butter. Versus unsaturated fatty acids, right? They are missing at least one hydrogen, if not more, due to the presence of a double bond, right? So if carbon is double bonded to each other, that leaves less room, all right? Hydrogen cannot come in and attach in as many places, right? So it's missing some attachment points for hydrogen. It's not have the maximum amount of hydrogen it possibly could, right? And when we see these uh, unsaturated fatty acids, they typically have a bend in them, right? I know it's hard to see in this picture, but there is a double bond between these two carbon-hydrogen um, atoms here, and that causes a bend in this shape. Now, just the presence of a singular double bond, and have more than one double bond, but just a singular double bond changes the properties of these fatty acids, right? Now they can no longer solidify at room temperature. So now we're thinking of things like vegetable oils. Yes. Yes, yes. But because as a whole, this lipid has at least that one that is unsaturated, we would just say this whole thing is a unsaturated lipid. But it has one unsaturated fatty acid. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Phospholipids you might be familiar with. Um, if you think back to the last biology class that you took, Phospholipids are really common in cell membranes. Now, they are very similar to fats in that they have a uh, glycerol protein, or not glycerol molecule that they're attached to, right? They have fatty acids, but they only have two of them, right? So instead of three, you have two, right? So those two fatty acids are attached to the glycerol, similar to our... Um, other lipids that we have seen here, but it also has this phosphate group. Mm -hmm. Instead of a third fatty acid, it has a phosphate group instead. Now this is important. Yes. That's a good question. I don't know that they have to be unsaturated, but I know that phospholipids have different configurations to them. So when we talk about like these uh, cell membranes, some of them tend to be more bent than others. But I'm not sure what to that. I'm not sure why they might have like two bends instead of one. That's a great question. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Important feature of our phospholipids is they have a polar and an unpolar region or non-polar region. What purpose does it serve? Um, purpose wise. Probably has something to do with being able to transport things through that membrane. So we'll talk about this, I think, next week, that these membranes are semi-permeable, meaning some things can come in, some things cannot. 
And these tails probably likely have a lot to do with what they're going to let in and not. So I think that's purpose wise. Yeah. So that brings up a great point though, because those tails are non-polar and because they don't like water, right, they tend to um, sit next to each other in our uh, cell membrane here. Versus we have that polar region, we call that the hydrophilic head, right? And it's polar because we have this phosphate group on it. All right, we're gonna talk a lot more about phospholipids um, before your first exam. Um, when we talk about cells. The last lipid I want to touch on here are steroids, right? So steroids, very different type of lipid, right? They do not have fatty acids. What's um, common about all steroids is that they have these uh, four rings, these four uh, carbon silicon rings on them. So you can see on this image here, we have our four carbon rings joined together, right? Now the type of additional attachment to those carbon rings is what kind of gives them each their unique properties. Uh, these steroids, uh, they can be embedded within cell membranes. Right? Um, they can also be the starting material for a lot of other different types of steroids like sex hormones are steroids. So think testosterone and estradiol. Right? Often when we think of steroids, we often think of these anabolic steroids, right? Might be um, in the context of drug use in some sporting aspects, right? Um, it, it is a steroid, right? It's a variant of testosterone, right? And it helps in building up muscle mass. And it's not just used by athletes, right? Uh, they can be used to help treat diseases like anemia or diseases that might destroy body tissues, right? So they, sometimes they get a bad rep but they can be very useful. But they do have a whole variety of side effects that come along with them, like depression and mood swings. Um, you can have liver damage or high cholesterol and blood pressure. Any questions? We are now gonna go back to answer Mandy's question here. So, yes, we can get like water and oil to mix sometimes. So maybe if like a salad dressing is a great example of this. You might have like an oil-based salad dressing. Sometimes they separate out and you leave it in the bottle. Sometimes they don't, right? A lot of times when they don't, we have something what's called an emulsifier inside of this salad dressing. So I want us to take the next five minutes here. I'm so glad we have enough time to do this because I was going to have to make it a take-home question. I didn't want to do that. Um, next five minutes to answer this question here. So, mayonnaise contains both oil and water, but mayonnaise does not separate out, all right? And this is because of emulsifiers um, that are naturally found like egg yolks, um, lecithin, which is not how I thought it was pronounced, but lecithin is an emulsifier. So I wanna know, how does lecithin promote the mixing of water and lipid molecules? You don't have to do a little bit of Googling to see how this works. Uh, so take five minutes. Uh, work with your groups here, and then we'll come back and uh, talk about it.
I'll explain it in a bit here, but before we move on, uh, who can uh, tell me how does a multiplier work? Drawing up here, right? We have our hydrophobic ends bonding with the hydrophobic material. In this case, it could be oil. Those hydrophilic parts, right, are going to be surrounding the outside and in contact with the water here. And basically, because it surrounds these globules of like oils, it's not going to allow the oil to kind of reform into a large mass again. Right? It helps it kind of dissolve in water. It's not really an through dissolving, but it's breaking it down into little globules that can't be combined. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Also, I just want to reiterate homework. So initially, I was going to have you watch this video and take a quiz because you already have two things to do on Friday. So if you want to watch that video, great. It is not required. Right? But what is due is that about you questionnaire. Uh, come to my office hours to drop it off. And if you, your schedule does not allow that, let me know. Okay. Uh, I do have office hours immediately after this. And content check number one is up on Moodle. It is going to be due in class on Friday, but I will give you the in class question during class. Okay. And that'll be something that you can work together on as a group. Any questions about homework? All right. Well, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day outside. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>